Neil wants moose loose in Scotland, so he's in Lapland to study and hunt them. I think they'd notice if I let them out. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but I think they have a place in our forest. And we get to hear a little history about the Blaser straight pull rifle. I think one or maybe two weeks later we had the first prototype of the R93. Dan Thor is mixing up his pheasant season with simulated game. We join him on a shoot in Hertfordshire where the signature stand is the Bog Rabbit. The foxes are on the move in Devon, pairing up and generally being more visible, especially if you have the latest thermal kit. Fox shooter Tom Davis is prowling after them. Bangs and bangers, Kai is showing us how to put some sizzle into our pheasant recipes with pheasant sausages. So that's ready for the chiller. And thinking of a second-hand PCP, James Head from Airgun Shop Crackshot gives his expert tips on what to buy and what to avoid. We're giving away a new green Rannock jacket from Jack Pike priced at £69.95. David is on the new stump and James Marchington has hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Neil's Lapland adventure is pretty special. It falls between the end of the salmon season and the start of the moose and bird hunting seasons. So, there's a chance of a McNab of sorts. A McSwede, McViking, McVolvo. With the Capacali already in the bag and in the flat bread wraps, tastes a bit like pheasant according to the chaps on the ground, moose is now the order of the day. Before we start hunting, Neil wants to start learning, and what better way than a little moose zoo, just down the road from our base in Yokfall. Here I have a big boy, his name is Oscar. Wow. And he's, he's a nice boy. Yeah. Many girls, when they come in here, ask me if it's possible to kiss Oscar today. Yes. Of course, you can kiss him. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if they can't kiss Oscar, do they kiss you? Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. no. <laughs> no, no <laughs> and this is, this is Franz. Okay. He's three years old. And this is a female. You see, a female and no gewalt. Yeah, yeah. And what are the characteristics you're looking for? Are you looking for something specific in the, in the bulls? What is a good one? What's a bad one? When you have these for visitors, they cannot be angry. Yeah. They must be very, very kind. And you see so kind they are. So this little one, he was, I think, three kilos when the baby's born. But when they drink milk from the elk, uh -huh. they grow 20 kilos every month. Really? So in five months, when the snow coming, 300 kilos. Incredible, yeah. But Oscar is so strong. That is the law in the forest. It's always the biggest and strongest boy he made the babies. Yeah. So uh, how long will the old fella live? How many years? 15, 20? Uh, yeah, 20, a little more than 20. More than 20? More than 20 years. Wow. They're living a long time. Do you think you have these animals in Scotland in the future? W w I hope they do. Mm. I hope they do. When, if they, if they want to bring back a natural environment, mm. they can't cherry pick. Mm. They can't say, I like this animal, I don't like that one. I think if you do them, you do them all or you do nothing. Mm. The big craze at the moment in the UK is like Europe. They want wolf, wolf, wolf. Wolf, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But with so many m millions of sheep, yes. it's a problem. You cannot have wolf. No, no. You have some wolf in this area? Not, not many because it's likely to shoot them because here is so many reindeer. Yeah, yeah, and they kill them. It's mm. important. Yeah, yeah. I think deer, just it's a spiritual thing, David, being close to them. And uh, we spoke to the man that, that has them a few moments ago and he was saying he needs deer in his life. I have deer living outside my house. And uh, I just think there's something quite fascinating and addictive about them. The moose are an interesting species because I mean, it formerly they lived in Scotland and then all this rewilding that goes on, it fascinates me that they, they talk about lynx and they talk about wolf and, and restoring natural order. 
And to my mind, that animal there is, is a missing ingredient because in the natural forests of Scotland, the, the moose existed. What is interesting is the effect that climate will have on them because they, they do well in the Arctic countries. So they're, they're spread through Scandinavia, Alaska, parts of North America, Russia. And how would they cope with climate change if they were reintroduced? But as a passionate deer guy, I, I, I'd love to see them back. My, my intention long term is, is to have some of them. But unfortunately at the moment, they're considered a dangerous wild animal, which is fascinating when culturally people think letting a lynx go is absolutely fine and that's not a dangerous <laughs> wild animal. So, I mean, you can see they, they look dangerous wild animals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we feel threatened, do yeah. But the, I think for mankind, the sheer presence of an animal of that size is good for us. Yes. I think we need them. We need them. Uh, you said that these are more ancient than red deer. So in evolutionary terms in Europe, these guys have been knocking around a lot longer. So them and the roe deer, in evolutionary terms, in the habitats of, of uh, the U Europe and the UK, are older species. So they've been around a lot longer. And, and their adaption is probably to a quite different climate to the one we have today. But you can see that they're, they're coping with it here. The challenge is how well they'll cope with it. You'll know this. You'll probably give me the... The, the kingdom, phylum, genus, everything else. So Alcus, we'll Alcus. Okay, Alcus, Alcus. Yeah. But as, as... So they're Cervidae, they all belong into the, the group of Cervidae. So they are deer. But they are deer? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That means they'll do the same thing as deer do when it comes to forests though. So that's why Scotland's not going to really open their arms to them. Well, it, but the trouble is if you, if you want natural, you want natural. You, you, can't, uh, you can't cherry pick. And, and this is what fascinates me, we are cherry picking, we're saying we love beavers, let's let beavers go. People have done it illegally and they've now been naturalised, no one complains. But uh, It's going to be harder to get one of these under the radar though. I think they'd notice if I let them out. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but I think they have a place in our forests. If we are going to have natural, functioning, healthy ecosystems, these guys need to be there. So we should have them back. It was interesting, he was saying that about the nutrition of the elk milk, calves are growing at the rate of 20 kilos a month. So by the time the harsh winter conditions come in, that'll be 100 kilos. The crofting farming side of me makes me think how viable these guys would be as a, as a, as a farm meat product. So don't be surprised if I tried to croft moose. <laughs> there could be a moose loose about this house. Oh, someone has to say it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Look out for Rowan Tree's organic moose milk coming to a dispenser near you. With our moose masterclass done, it's back to Yorkfall to get ready for our hunt. As well as a blazer drilling, Neil's also been loaned a more familiar bit of kit, the R8. 270. Years ago I kind of went off the 270 because when you're doing standing shooting, very often what you would get is you would get muzzle flip and if you were shooting in woodlands the animal could go out the sight as you fired the shot and you'd have to work a bit harder to see where it had gone if it was rib shot. Now with the moderator on it, it's made the 270 an attractive calibre again. An awful lot of people that had stopped using it have gone back to it. Mm. I haven't shot anything with a 270 in about a decade. So let's see what happens. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of revisiting going on in this, yes. isn't there? Isn't there? Absolutely. No 270s and no salmon fishing. I'm back doing both. Why do you shoot the blazer? What's, what's, what is it that's different about that rifle over other, other products? The thing I like about the blazer rifle, and I've used a lot of different brands in the, over the years, the quality of the steel, I think, for me, makes a difference. And people will say, why? When you're doing a, a lot of rifle shooting, and if your barrel's getting hot, then uh, you'll find, or I've found with some brands, if you put them under pressure, and, you, and particularly if you're setting your rifle up for a hot zero, if you're, if you're firing a lot of rounds, and occasionally we can be shooting 20, 30 animals at a time, then uh, the quality of the steel seems to... You, can, you get tighter groups, David. That's the the long and the short of it. So you'll get a tighter group and we've tried it, we've, you know, we've put them hot down, uh, down the range at a distance to see how tight a group we get. And consistently against other brands, which I won't name because it's not kind, the, the blazer keeps a, a tighter group, which means for shooting a lot of animals accurately, it's, it's what I go for. Later, we'll have a unique insight into blazer's straight pull journey from a man who was there at the start. First, we need a plan. So when you were moving, we're moving super slow until then. We've travelled a few hours from Yockfold ground near Kengis and a stunning fishing lodge. Mm -hmm. Bjorn's family have owned this estate for generations. 
He is our host. Robin from Yockfall will be our guide. Dogs, of course, will play a big role over the next three days. Look at that size. And it's hunting a moose that's massive. And it's not afraid of it, it just goes. Once in the hunting area, Robin takes a moment to wish his dog safe travels. This is no walk in the park. It's a dangerous life for a moose dog as well. You never know if it will return. So I always just wish him luck and, and so on. Because I have lost dogs in, before and I regretted that I didn't do this before. So, With the elk hound hunting, Robin is able to track him using software on his phone. However, they're not totally reliant on tech. The dog hunts an area, then returns, checking in, then is off again. We trek through beautiful forest, some is natural, some plantation. We also cross expanses of wetland, they're dotted with hay racks. We learn that big grants are paid by the EU for hay to be taken off here by hand. All these swamp areas were taken down the grass and fed to the reindeers. It's labour intensive, but it's the traditional way the indigenous Sami people provide food for their free wandering reindeer over winter, lifting forage above the fallen snow. After a couple of hours and a couple of kilometres, Robin says we're on a moose. It isn't far from us when the dog picks it up. Now it's going 12 k's an hour. But he's. Hopefully he will be able to go around it and make it stop. It's not moving in the direction he hopes and we abort as the dog is nearing one of the few roads. Robin calls in the cavalry to get us to him fast. Peter guided us last year. Thankfully all is well and our super fit hound gets the lunch of champions. The dogs that we're using to hunt moose are basically athletes, world class athletes. So they need all the energy to get quickly food afterwards, to get the energy back quickly. So I usually use it's a can, kind of a canned meat from Royal, Royal Cannon Recovery. It's basically, you could say it's, it's a banana. So and you're not supposed to eat, even if you're a human or a dog or who else, if you have been training really, really hard, you shouldn't eat immediately after a big meal, but you should have something in you quite quickly. And this is a powder, it's basically rehydration, so you bind the water a little bit better in the body. And it helps the dog to recover a lot quicker. And I also put some, put some water in it so it gets even more. And I have noticed that it is, has a big impact on the recovery of the dogs when I do this. But the dogs like it. Cool. With everyone rested, we're off out again. More kilometers, more monitoring. Being in the company of Robin and other locals, Neil is getting a sense of how hunting works here. Significantly, they are responsible for managing the moose numbers. Government is at arm's length. How many sort of moose would you expect about in this area per square kilometre? Where I'm hunting, we have one moose in one kilometre. What do you call it? Kilometre square, yeah. Kilometre square, yeah. If you go back ten years ago, we had seven, eight, nine mooses in that area. Uh, but 10 years ago, the government decided that it should lower the population of mooses. So it has been doubled to get the population down. And it has been a good thing that they did it, because I believe it was too much mooses. It was mooses everywhere. And it was bad for the forest industry, a lot of car accidents. Uh, I'm a spare time firefighter, so I had to go out on car, car accidents all the time. So it's a good thing, but now I believe we should let it up again and find the limit so we keep it in this uh, yeah. amount of population. The practice in Sweden isn't for the government to use government contractors or government hunters. Oh. It's you as the community that manage the deer. Yeah, it works like this, that you are a hunting team and we are renting a land from the government for a certain amount of money. 
and then we pay for every moose that we shoot. But if we tell to the government in practice, if we tell them we don't want to shoot anymore, we consider it's not enough mooses here and we have shot four and it's four left on the license. In practice, they can put in uh, hunters and, and finish the hunt for us in practice. Okay. But culturally in, in your groups, that's, that doesn't happen? No, no it doesn't. But, but you've been totally successful in reducing the deer population. Yeah. And no one paying taxes had to pay for this. In fact, you paid to do it. Yeah. It's contrastingly different from yeah. uh, Scotland, where on the public estate, and this is roughly the same, this is public land, yeah. they, they pay contractors to do the deer management. They don't let guys like you do it. The belief is that you can't. Mm. But obviously, reality over here, here, over you here do. they understand that it's a big culture thing, that almost everyone in every household has a hunter in, in the family. That done it in generation and generations so so we have high knowledge in the population here in the hunting and you have your own dogs and yeah. you look after them and they're part of the family yeah i get this yeah. but for us you know for looking it's maybe you should come and have a look in scotland one time and you'd see a big big difference in thinking was, was that an invite yes i'm coming yep. with the afternoon delivering some not so close encounters they've called in the big guns from the south of sweden Michael has travelled overnight and will be hunting here for the next month with his friend Simon from Scotland. It's no surprise that Neil and Simon know each other. Michael has been hunting moose for decades and he has shot more than a hundred of them with this dog, so we're feeling confident. It's a good job as we leave today. No pressure. Neil spots that Michael also has a blazer straight pull, but an R93 which is the perfect moment for us to introduce Gunter Stoschek, Blazer's creative director. Gunter's here to write an article for Blazer's in-house hunting magazine, Passion. And that is something he's always had for the products and the brand, even as a small boy. And I don't know why, but Blazer fascinated me, really. He joined the company in the late 1970s as an apprentice gunsmith and has worked in roles including sales, marketing, as creative director, he's been responsible for producing the big screen epics at the international trade shows. He was there when Blaser suggested a new rifle design. I think it, it was a Friday evening. Normally we would finish, but Mr. Blank, the, the owner, he bought the Blaser company from Mr. Blaser. He came in the workshop with two big boxes of beer. And he said, oh, my wife is on holidays, let's drink us a beer. And we are talking and talking and everybody has fun with, this, with the products of Plaza. And we discussed how can we make the, the bolt action rifle better, we, what can we improve with the bolt action rifle. And so one of the gunsmiths has an idea and then came another idea and another idea. And Mr. Blank said, wow, we will do that, make a prototype. And I think one or maybe two weeks later, we had the first prototype of the R93. So when that first idea came about, what did you think? You're going to have to market this product. I think I have a good stomach feeling. I, am, I was sure it will be a success. And it, it, it was a big success for Blaser. What makes it special for you? The most important thing is that Mr. Blank, he was a passionate hunter. The owner now, both owners, Mr. Lücke and Mr. Ortmeier, are passionate hunters. That's the most important thing. And also, we are so many hunters in the company and everybody has ideas and try to bring ideas in. And then we check, does it work, can it work? And sometimes it works very well. <laughs> Back to the forest, and Michael is now using two dogs. It looks like they may be bringing a moose back towards us, so Neil gets ready and steady. I have a bad feeling I'm in the company of a master at what he does. It's quite interesting to watch his dogs work. Really good. And this fresh sign of moose. Fingers crossed. Last chance to move this boundary. We'll give our best shot.
Sadly, the moose has other ideas, and so do the dogs, which eventually head off into a neighbouring estate. Michael will stay in the forest. We are sent for sustenance. With time ticking by, we hear that Michael has a moose cow and calf in his sights. There is no way we can join him. Over the radio, we hear he's taken the calf. And the hunt stops in 12, no, eight minutes, and it was shot 22 minutes ago. So, uh, I just sort of on the, the line this time. Yeah. And a calf, yeah? Yeah, a calf from this year. How long do you have to wait for the opportunity for a shot? Uh, I was close for almost two hours. How are you doing? Wow. Uh, closer than 60 meters. And, uh, two hours at 60 meters? Yeah, but she was protecting the calf all the time. And uh, the, wor the dog worked between me and the cow, and the cow wanted to stand between the dog and the calf. So it was locked positions for a long time. But then uh, I whistled at the, uh, at the dog, and the cow was a little bit worried she took a half step forward. Then I get the shoulder clear on the calf. So. Did you record any of it on your phone? No. Ah, you horrible man. <laughs> <laughs> By purpose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The extraction is hard work, but there is a reward for these guys' efforts. He'll be taken straight to the larder. Learned a lot this week? Oh, it's been interesting. A lot about how they do things with dogs. That's your takeaway, do you think? Dogs, like a ticks. Different habitat. For more information about the Blaza R8 straight pull rifle in all its guises, go to blaza.de. To look for R8 deals across a network of UK gun shops, go to kitfinder.co.uk. The Vikings aren't as tough as they used to be, yeah? To discover more the about the wonderful the outdoor experiences that Swedish Lapland offers, check out the Heart of Lapland website and one of their top destinations, Jogfall, known especially for its salmon fishing. Thank you, Neil, and all who helped us out in Sweden. If you're interested in buying a Blaza R8, we found some dealers with the rifle in stock and put them on a page on Kitfinder, link below. Now, the Field Sports Nation. This week, Field Sports Nation members get to enter a draw to win a shooting coat, a Jack Pike Rannock jacket in green. Find out how to enter on their TV show, Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays. Watch the TV show by joining them for a fiver a month and support our news service, which rights the anti's wrongs over shooting. Link to that below. Now, another right that's often wrong. Get it? It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The next stage of the Westminster government's attempt to ban lead ammunition closes on Sunday. The 6th of November 2022 is the deadline for the Health and Safety Executive's public consultation on a proposed restriction on lead in ammunition. Anyone can take part and explain their support or opposition to the ban that the government wants to impose. Link below. Devon and Cornwall Police is sending out an email to all applicants explaining the chaos surrounding firearms licensing. While other forces have run normal firearms licensing throughout COVID, Devon and Cornwall Police continue to blame the pandemic lockdowns for the collapse of its service. Its email refers to weapon instead of firearm, showing a misunderstanding of the licensing process. It refers to legislation when it means statutory guidance. It mentions delays in licensing, but not the delays of up to two and a half years that some shooters have suffered. It goes on to beg gun owners not to contact them. The breakdown in gun licensing service, which covers Devon, Cornwall and Dorset, is threatening local businesses. One gun shop in Devon has had to diversify into selling barbecues. There's a lot of individuals out there with gun licenses um, that haven't been renewed. There's a lot of individuals out there that are still waiting on variations. I've got many customers that have been waiting over two years for grants, over two years, which is totally unacceptable. So what are you doing to, to, to rectify the problem more than trying to explain to me why there's a problem? A new video showing the reality of ecotourism is even appalling hardline animal rights activists.
The film shows lions catching and killing a topi, or hearty beast, as safari vehicles and taxis hoot and jockey for position around the kill so that tourists can take pictures. Hunting organisations condemn the actions of the drivers and onlookers. Herman Ells from Sustainable Use Coalition of South Africa says that the film shows how much more damaging ecotourism is than hunting. We, we can't see that as conservation, um, irrespective of the money which goes into Serengeti and that which is important for conservation, th that just cannot happen. A woman wrongly implicated in a hit and run on a hunt sab says the same sabs are now threatening her life. An estate owner accused by hunt saboteurs of driving a 4x4 suspected of a hit and run denies being involved. The woman who runs a historic countryside wedding venue reveals she is now receiving death threats and is in fear of her life. Saboteurs posted a video showing an animal rights protester being run over by a vehicle. Footage shows a woman in her 40s being knocked down by a 4x4 while trying to disrupt a hunt. A local hospital released her unhurt. The Packham 3 needs support. The three men facing court action from the BBC TV presenter Chris Packham for libel over articles in Country Squire magazine need to raise around £250,000. As part of that, they're holding charity auctions on two auction websites. Lots on offer include a hosted dinner for eight at a private club, donated by Bailey's Hunting Directory, an Aston Martin driving experience, various shoot days and a gin tour. Link below. The Scottish Government is expanding its land reform scheme by buying up estates. Forestry Land Scotland is thought to be paying £25 million of taxpayers' money to buy the Glen Prosen estate in Angus. Formerly a sporting estate, the Scottish Government will reduce wildlife management and turn it over to forestry. The Scottish Government, which refuses to comment on the purchase, also appears to be breaking a promise to avoid secret land deals, following a trend of wealthy landowners living abroad and selling their property for environmental projects. Animal rights activist group PETA says it will sue the Ministry of Defence for refusing to replace bearskin caps with fake fur. The group claims that the MOD has failed to consider its synthetic replacement. PETA says its campaign for fur to be replaced with a substitute since 2002. In February, the MOD said the Guardsmen take great pride in wearing the current cap. A vegan blogger has put out a film defending trophy hunting. Ryan Dalton, who has appeared in the Game Fair Theatre with Charlie, visited Namibia with pro-hunting academic Adam Hart to look at the subject in detail. Antis have attacked him online for the film. Sami reindeer herders in Norway are facing new dangers. Lumps of ice shed from wind turbines. The 65 metre blades throw the ice blocks at up to 180 miles per hour, which leads to a 250 metre exclusion zone around the windmill sites. This doesn't apply to the herders, who have to get onto the sites to bring in their animals. Before the wind turbines went up, the operating company assured the herders that the blades would not shed ice. But from October to May, they receive emails about it every day. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. US politicians are putting guns at the heart of their political ads as a positive, not a negative. The midterm elections are for all of the seats in Congress and around a third of the seats in the Senate. They are mainly held on the 8th of November 2022. This year, many Republicans see images of guns in their TV ads as a way to show support for core Republican values, such as the Second Amendment right to bear arms. US political campaigns have spent more than six billion US dollars on adverts this year, a new record. Forest officials in North East India are confiscating guns, air rifles, nets and catapults to protect a falcon. Amur falcons make an autumn pit stop in Assam, Nagaland and Manipur on their way to sunny South Africa, where they feed on termites and grasshoppers. Forestry officials are concerned that local people shoot thousands of raptors to roast them or turn them into curries. And finally, a jackdaw in a village in Yorkshire has become so accustomed to being fed, it's now attacking people for food. Nicknamed Derek, the bird lives in Rossington near Doncaster. One mum reports that Derek has forced all the kids at school to go inside at playtime. However, she adds, most of the kids love him. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts.
buying shooting kits, then head to Kit Finder, and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thank you, David. Next, Kai App Bryn continues his culinary journey with the help of a butchery kit supplier, Veschenfelder. This week, it's pheasant sausages. Today's going to be a bit of a fun one. We're going to make some pheasant sausage using the Leonard's pheasant mix from Weschenfelder. They sent this down to me. We've got a bundle of pheasants from last season, some fatty pork. First thing is the uh, Trespade mincer. Absolutely fantastic bit of kit. We've used it many times now and it's very sturdy and robust. The good thing about this, you get to use everything of the pheasant. So all the leg, all the breast, all the offcuts. Just chuck it in there and I'm going to mix that with the pork and the seasoning to make some, hopefully, to make some excellent sausages. So I'm gonna turn this machine on, it's gonna get a bit noisy, and then we're gonna start processing it through. There we go. So we've put the pheasant through once, I like to put it through twice, and I've got fatty pork mince here from my local butcher, which has been put through once. It's gonna mix it all together, have you ever seen a pheasant pre-prepared mix before? No, I haven't. Quite cool with the fact that people are paying for that market, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, people don't really know what to do with them. And by utilizing not just for roasting or kind of pan frying the breasts, we can make them into delicious sausages and burgers and everything else. So the fact that this is available and easy for people at home to make, you know, all the kits here, all you have to do is go online and order it and then just keep buying the mix. Not only that, if you're, if you're adventurous with your cooking at home, you can go on from that and just tailor everything to your own taste buds. Right, let's put this cold water in with this. It's a bit messy now, but wow. it's gonna, it might take me a few minutes. A serious amount of sausage, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix this through, then when we put back through the mincer, they'll also mix it through for you as well. These sausage stuffers are fantastic. You need to press it down at the end to compress it so there's no air pockets, and then fill it up. And there we go. How good are you at the, uh, the art of sausage stuffing? We're about to find out, aren't we? <laughs> this could be quite comical. The handy thing about these stuffers is Everything comes apart, so it's really, really easy to clean. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna tie them up. So I'm gonna just break them into threes. And tie that, push that through. Okay, okay. So here we go, let's see how these tie up. I didn't realise I was going to get this for the demonstration. Well, don't count your chickens yet. Oh, first, very kind. That's good. Over the top. And then... So you don't twist them as such, you just bend them. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's different ways of doing it, but this is the, this is the way I was taught. So, I'm a bit clumsy with it because it's, you know, I don't do it every day, so... So these are now going to be hung on hooks into the in the chiller and this will dry out. The problem is when, it, when they're too wet, they'll split a lot easier. So you need the sausages to kind of go firm, and then they'll uh, be a bit more robust. So when you cook, they won't split as much. You've seen us make it, now let's cook it. So I'm intrigued to taste this. Are you, David? Mm -hmm. I think so. So I put it at medium heat. Because it's fresh and it hasn't hung for that long, it may split, but that's fine, because all we're gonna do is just taste it for now. Moment of truth, David. Yeah, intrigued. Oh, that's hot. I'll cut it in the middle, okay? Mm. Looks nice, doesn't it? it? Smells really nice. It smells really good. Really fragrant, isn't it? Mm. Quite pleasant. It's moist enough. In a bun as well, it'd be really yeah, nice, you know? Yeah. 
some onions. Yeah, well done. Mm. Good job. Good way of using pheasant, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. More? Of course. Thanks. Kai, and we have a new exclusive offer for Feschenfelder kit for you this month. It's the same 10% discount to all viewers using the code FS10 at checkout as normal. This time, Veschenfelder is offering three items, an electric mincer usually priced at £234, a stuffer that's normally £150, and a pheasant sausage mix of herbs and spices priced at £6.50. Links below. Now, the pheasant season for many of us has a lot more simulated game than usual. Dan Thor is off with his mates to enjoy a sim shoot with a twist. This is the year for simulated game days to flower. Lack of pheasants and partridges means it's the sim day's moment in the sun. And that's why Instagram star Dan Thor and his friends are enjoying a sim day today, not far from Stevenage in Hertfordshire. <laughs> it's everything you'd expect from a sim game shoot. A lovely day out in the countryside, fast action, plenty of banter, and more targets than you can shake a double barrel stick at. Be quick on that one, Fred out. This is no ordinary sim day. Here's a clue to what's coming later. For now, it's time to swap places. It's Dan's turn to shoot while Fred the gamekeeper stuffs the cartridges. Dan is shooting his favourite Maruku MK38 and he's dressed for the occasion in his Jack Pike cap and shirt. He was wearing a fleece gilet too, but it's so mild today he's taken it off. Very good loading, Fred. That was a nice Lovely. Dan, it's Lovely. Bad, it's for you, Cheers. Start, though. It was both rusty, weren't we? Very rusty to start there, Fred. -o. Steve Reynolds has been running these suits for years and has it down to a T. We're going to get warmed up again in a minute. We're going to Sandy Bank in a minute, which is just through the meadow. Refresh your cartridge bags and follow me, please. <laughs> I remember Shannon's there. He has enough ball down here without them. <laughs> they do come out that side pretty quick. Don't they? Next up, it's the grouse butt. Dan reckons that tactics and teamwork are going to be crucial on this one. Well, um, personally, you want to take it in turns. So the guy on the left wants to just concentrate on the left birds. The guy on the right on the right. But when you're watching them two, they're both shooting the same clay. So when they're unloading, birds then getting away. So you literally want to try and work as a team and just concentrate on one. If he misses it, then go for it. But if not, just work as a team and you concentrate left to right and just go from there, really. But um, it's a bit of a tricky stand because you, you're eager to kill that clay and you know what it's like when you've got a gun in your hand, you want to let the shots off. But um, we'll see what these guys are like on this one. Like table. Yeah, don't be too quick just in case you do think. You literally, like you say, halfway between. But like I said, when mate's unloading, yeah. Both unloading, they're both flagging with a bird, but if you get like, he should load up now while he's full up, then you're going to get him on. Clear the guns, please. Well done. It is Dan's chance to put his theory to the test. That was really nice. To entertain us further, we have Matt. I'm Matty. With Freddie. Hey, same as last year. Now, Fred's in the hot seat, but his partner keeps beating him to the targets. <laughs> He's saving on cartridges, that boy. Hey! Fred, you'll be pleased to know it's all over. <laughs> 
Come on, boys. Oh, Fred, I went in there with 30 cars and come out 28. It's never a serious place. Yeah, it's safe and he's always on about health and safety, which is great because, you you know, you go on a few shoots and people are swinging guns left, right and centre. But here it's all about just having a good time with your friends and that's what we certainly had today, Fred, and yeah, we? Yeah, it is and it's nice. It's just nice and relaxed. You couldn't ask for nothing. Like but you're that, always really. relaxed, aren't you? Like you say, it's old school. Mm. Is that hot, Dan? Cough. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what do you think of that one, then, Fred? <laughs> yeah, it was lovely. Now it's when the fun begins for the rabbit on the toilet. We've had uh, uh, Park Meadow, we've had Shingle Bank, we've had the Poplars. We're calling this the bog drive. <laughs> <laughs> For reasons as you can see. <laughs> so you'll just need 10 cartridges in your pocket. Please come up and stand behind me and join in. Let's have a bit of fun. Chase the rabbit and knock its snout off. Okay. okay. Pull. Oh, good shot. Yeah, it's funny, one. one. It is funny. Look at the speed it goes out. Look. We have played the orange one. He's going to shoot in that one. Lovely shot. Nice shot on that first one, Dave. Oh. Pull. <laughs> Terrible on that one. Pull. <laughs> Rubbish. Couldn't get on that one up that side. Once again. Same as last year, up that left. Ladies and gentlemen, we saw match nerves creeping. Cough, all the way through the match nerves. <laughs> shot, Fredo. Good shot. And then coming on to it. Oh. I think he's going to drop it. Oh. Oh. Good shooting, though, Fred. <laughs> Really nice shooting there, mate. This boy was the man who was very good on the toilet seat. I mean, do you spend quite a bit of time on the toilet, home, Fred? Or uh, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Quite regular. <laughs> but that's one of those clays. Obviously, I'm never used to shooting sitting down. It's not an excuse. Um, yeah, I shot really bad on it. But um, it's a difficult clay, obviously, when you're shooting something speed behind you, then coming onto a really fast rabbit with a gap of about two or three yards. Yeah. But no, um, Fred shot it very well, and so did some of the girls today. So it's been it's been a pleasure. Next, Steve deploys his secret weapon a homemade oh, yeah. trap that can throw rabbit clays fast enough to challenge the entire team. Here we go, rock and roll. Are you ready, gentlemen and ladies? Here we go, Hamel's Park, the Mad Mini. Oh, come out quickly. We always have a fantastic evening here. Steve is a bloody good host, as you can see, um, puts on some good clays and he also plays a few games here and there, which is also good throughout the day. Um, everyone seems to have had a bloody good day. Like I say, it's always an awesome sunset end of this. And yeah, no, thank you very much, Steve. It's been great, as always. It's always a pleasure. At the end of the day, we must never lose sight of the fact we're in the entertainment industry. Yeah. And when you can hear the guns laughing, yes, they've had some good shooting, but they need some fun mixed in with it. Exactly. I've, hopefully I've hit the spot. You certainly have there. Lovely. So no, thank, thank you very much, Steve. Pleasure, mate. Always. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. You can follow Dan on Instagram at Dan Thor Shooting. Find out about Jack Pike clothing at jackpike.co.uk. And for more about Maruku, go to maruku.eu. Thanks, Dan. And if Dan's Maruku MK38 takes your fancy, we've dug out dealers who have stock of it and the prices they're prepared to part with it and we've put them on a page on Kitfinder, link below. Next, it's off to the other end of the country, Dartmoor, where love is in the air and Tom Davis is going fox shooting. It's autumn in the southwest of England and the foxes are getting romantic. 
That means they drop their guard, which gives pro fox shooter Tom Davis an opportunity. We got a lot of uh, fresh cut maize. Um, so plenty of maize stubble around. Um, we got some fresh cut grass. So we're gonna look over that. And it's a good time of year to try and get on top of some foxes. It's coming up to mating season now, although seasons are a bit all over the place, but uh, yeah, normally November time's a good mating month, so. Well, fresh cut grass in October, so. Yeah, I don't know what, I th must have been something to do with all the dry weather we had this summer. Um, but yeah, I know they've been out and they've made a load of gra grass today, um, which, yeah, was strange. I heard it going, so I had a quick look. Um, so yeah, we'll check over that. We've got a game farm nearby. Um, he reckons he's seeing a fox around, so we'll check around the valley around there. And also lambing season's just around the corner as well. So if we can get some vixens this evening, that'd be great. Get on top of them before they have cubs next year. So that'd be good. Fox patrol. Yes, foxing tonight. It's not long before Tom spots an animal. Yeah, I've got one down below here on May stubble. It, you, you've got to kind of like loop round to so you'll see you're shooting away from the main road. Um, so sometimes it can be a, tri a bit tricky because it is a big field as well. And with a perfectly moonlit night, <laughs> it's not going to be great, but uh, we'll give it a go. Hey! Yeah, got him. He stood and looked when I was squeaking, but uh, he, he started moving away. So whistle didn't work, well it was a bit dry so it wouldn't be that loud. <laughs> uh, so quick shout and yeah he stopped. I ranged it, it was about 150 metres and then it, he went on a bit so yeah about 160 right. metres. So. Yeah on the maize stubble which is good. What's he looking um, for in the maize stubble? Is it bits of old mouse and rat and things like that? Yeah anything, you know, foxes eat anything really. You know, I've shot foxes with a mouthful of worms, uh, you, you know they, they do eat quite a lot of different things. Um, but yeah I mean this was done this field was cut last week so I would have thought they would have cleared up anything half decent you know like mice and stuff like that oh you bugger it's right in line with all the buildings in the background I didn't ping it, it must have been a bit further than what I thought because um, he's dead, but he ran a little bit before he dropped. But yeah, roughly 250 metres. But yeah, it's a funny one that. When we stopped over there, I switched the engine off and he spooked. To be fair, normally I would, like when they're out in the field, if I'm in the truck driving, um, I keep the engine running. Uh, just that bit of sound just takes me over and we've got the road behind, which does help as well. But, uh, but yeah, no, he did spook. Nothing wrong with the shot, he just ran. You know, I'm using 75 grain VMAX. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a surprise that he ran that far. Another one down, same field, which is good. Um, there was another one here, which I'm presuming they're pairing up, but uh, I can't see that one unless he's gone into the valley. So we'll have a quick whip round so we can find that one. But yeah, I'm going all right so far, considering the moon. <laughs> That's one of the good things about the Pulsar merger that Tom is using. The rangefinder is especially helpful in the dark, but only if you remember to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Two rabbits perfectly lined in each other. We drive on to the edge of the game farm to find the next fox. He was making his way up to the uh, little cops to the left here. The, the main stubble was just behind, he was this side of the hedge mine. Um, so yeah, before he got to the cops, I uh, done what I had to do. <laughs> the foxes might be more into each other than into Davis danger, but it doesn't always go Tom's way. Strange. Clean mess. He stopped at about 300 and had another go. Oops again. But it was only 190. It's not limping either. <laughs> <laughs> 
we take it as a sign. It's been a three fox night thanks to a combination of yeah. pulsar, thermal and lust. Yeah, if you want the pulsar, there are links below. Lust? Well, you'll have to sort that out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tom, who's using the same rifle there for foxes as Neil uses for moose. Yeah, but in a different calibre. And Tom's Pulsar kit, the Merger Spotter and the Thermion 2 LRD XP50 scope are both on their own pages with prices and dealers who have stock on Kit Finder, link below. Now staying in Devon, James Head from air gun shop Crackshot gives his advice on how to buy a second-hand PCP air rifle. James Head says there are lots of good reasons to buy a second-hand PCP plus a few man traps. He starts with the positives. So, if you're just looking at this gun in particular... So you've just chosen a very, very beautiful one. I have. <laughs> so this one in particular is in very, very good condition. So you can see it's got a few little dings, a few little marks on the stock. So this is all stuff that I would, you would expect to see from a pre-owned gun. What I wouldn't want is massive great cracks, gouges, um, and it, or if it did have that, you'd want to be aware of that and the price would be reflective of that. What you wouldn't want to do is buy something that doesn't look as in good condition. If it's looked after, generally, most people will look after stuff. If it looks good, it shoots good. It works like that. If it's been abused, you can probably imagine what it's going to be like. If it's got rust and stuff like that on the cylinder, I would avoid it. You don't really want anything that's going to have that imperfection, especially on a pressure vessel. Um, you can obviously just check that things aren't bent. Um, just visually by looking at that, you can tell that that is absolutely spot on. If you walk into a shop and your gun looks a little bit like this, I wouldn't buy it. I'd probably turn around and walk away again. So as you can see, the barrel is pointing uphill. It's hilarious if you, you know, it's a, it's a hundred yard gun, this one. Um, it takes a drop out for you. The reticle is also, I think, has been near a fire or something because it's all, the wires have pinged and they're all out of shape. It's a great scrappy challenge. James works for Devon and online air gun shop Crackshot, offering a range of sparkly second-hand and new pre-charged pneumatic air rifles. Visit crackshot.uk. There's more from Crackshot online, link below. Next, from air guns to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is James Marchington with Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, a James to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, Raddy from South Island Rifle Walkers heads into the mountains of New Zealand in the rut for an epic 12-day solo hunting adventure. Over in the USA, Wyoming predator hunts are using their dogs to lure normally wary coyotes into shootable range. A different type of dog work on this Turkish channel, where they're flushing out wild boar to rifles, even breaking into a sprint to intercept the quarry. No dogs here on Hunting Masters official in Pakistan. They're hunting cattle egrets with a catapult and making some impressive shots. Meanwhile, Catty Shack's Wayne Martin swaps his slingshot for a 12 bore to tackle some lovely driven partridge and duck at Ripley Castle in this film from Jack Pike. Chris Parkin reports from the recent Viking Arms dealer event at the West London Shooting School, showcasing loophole optics and a shiny new lever action Marlin rifle in 4570. South Somerset ferreters kick off the season with an action packed day ferreting a 250 yard hedge. Chaff gets a bit carried away and almost gives himself the proverbial poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Finally, it's always interesting to see a foreigner's take on hunting in the UK. Here's Ovini Expeditions going after Munchak and Chinese water deer in England and loving every minute. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye.